Victor, the Bishop of Rome, toward the end of the second century, he threatened the Eastern churches with excommunication. He threatened to divide the church between East and West and excommunicate the Eastern churches unless they bowed the Western method of determining the date of the celebration of Easter. Now, we look at something like this and go, really? But today, for example, amongst the Orthodox, there is an equally big argument about calendars, what calendar you're to use. And they're lobbying nuclear-tipped missiles at each other um, on that subject right now. So it ain't the first time that something like this has happened. So the Eastern churches say, hey, our way of determining Easter came from the apostles. Now, this is the time period where this type of claim starts to develop because it's Irenaeus who is going to claim he's the first person to use the phrase apostolic tradition. He's the first person to claim that he knows something that has been passed down outside of Scripture from the apostles. Only problem is that nobody in the world actually believes he was right. <laughs> he, um, Irenaeus developed a concept or was taught a concept called the recapitulation theory, where Jesus has to recapitulate all the ages of man to redeem all the ages of man. And so he taught that Jesus was an old man when he died. And he claimed this was taught to him by the apostles. This is an apostolic tradition. The Jesus is more than 50 years old when he died. Now, nobody east or west actually believes that. But that's the earliest example of quote-unquote apostolic tradition in the early church. So, when the eastern churches basically said to Victor, um, you can't excommunicate us for following the apostles. You don't have that authority. You aren't the head of the church. Now, Irenaeus, who is the Bishop of Lyon, which is in the West, not in the East, writes to Victor. And in the name of the entire region of Gaul, he rebukes the rash actions of the Roman bishop. And says, don't you remember what your predecessors did? And here's what, here's what Irenaeus wrote to Victor. For neither could Anicetus persuade Polycarp to forgo the observance in his own way, inasmuch as these things had been always so observed by John, the disciple of our Lord, and by other apostles with whom he had been conversant. Nor, on the other hand, could Polycarp succeed in persuading Anicetus to keep the obser obser observance in his way. For he maintained that he was bound to adhere to the usage of the presbyters who preceded him. And in this state of affairs, they held fellowship with each other. And Anicetus conceded to Polycarp in the church the celebration of the Eucharist by way of showing him respect. So that they parted in peace, one from the other, maintaining peace of the whole church, both those who did observe this custom and those who did not. And so Irenaeus says to Victor, cool your jets, dude. Polycarp and Anicetus managed to maintain fellowship. What's gotten under your saddle is basically what he says. Now, if we switched this around, and if it was Irenaeus who had rashly threatened the Eastern churches with excommunication, and Victor had written to him rebuking him in counseling peace, Victor's words would have been used as evidence of the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Because anything will be used as evidence of the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. That's all there is to it. But what you have is the reverse. Um, and so Victor does not follow through with this because he is rebuked for so doing, as was appropriate to do because no one had yet come up with the idea that the Bishop of Rome 
was the final authority in all things. One other thing about Irenaeus, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. When Irenaeus says that tradition is necessary for a proper understanding of God's truth, what did he mean? Did he mean some unwritten body of revelation that no one can show us in ancient church history anywhere? No. What Irenaeus meant is quite different than what is often asserted. Here is his definition. This is from the Nicene Fathers, uh, Volume 1, page 414 to 415, if you want to look it up. Here is the tradition that Irenaeus said was necessary to properly interpret Scripture. Listen. These have all declared to us that there is one God, creator of heaven and earth, announced by the law and the prophets, and one Christ, the Son of God. If anyone do not agree to these truths, he despises the companions of the Lord. Nay, more, he despises Christ himself, the Lord. Yea, he despises the Father also and stands self-condemned, resisting and opposing his own salvation, as is the case with all heretics. There it is. And what is it? Foundational, one God, creator of heaven and earth. Why is that so important? Because that's the very thing the Gnostics denied. The very thing the Gnostics denied. Now, does the scripture teach there is one God, creator of heaven and earth? Is this some new revelation that exists outside of scripture? No, it's an ordering principle. It's a foundational reality of what is already taught in scripture. That if you reject it, you end up, well, not only with the wacky interpretations of the Valentinian Gnostics, the regular Gnostics, the Manichaeans, but Joseph Smith as well. You have to start where the Bible starts. And if you don't, you're going to end up turning into a mishmash. So there you go. That was the actual tradition that, uh, that Irenaeus is making reference to.